Hey there, it's James here. And wouldn't it be fantastic if you could step into the minds of your future customers and clients? Yes, that's right. Today we're talking about predicting client behavior. And help me out, sitting with me right now is Jo Evershed. She's the founder and CEO of Cauldron Science, which means that she's the big brain behind Gorilla Experiment Builder, the Gorilla Experiment Builder. She's a technology innovator at the forefront of behavioral science. And she once ate bug soup, I'm told. How are you, Joe? Hi, James. I'm really well. Thank you so much for having me here today. <laughs> my pleasure. So I've got this idea of bug stew in my head. Maybe we'll come back to that. <laughs> Let's start with this. What is, what is behavioral research? Well, beha behavioral, behavioral science and behavioral research is the study of how humans think, feel, and behave on their own and in groups. So it's really the study of what it is to be a human. Um, and the reason why I think it's useful to have a behavioral scientist speaking here today is that to do well at marketing and sales, you need to understand how people think, feel, and behave on their own and in groups. So I'm pretty certain we have a lot to learn from each other. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I love just even the words there, think, feel, and behave. So there's three things we need to wrap our, hand, our brains around. And then by ourselves, and in groups. I mean, like we always go on and on about concepts like social proof. Uh, we refer to people like Aristotle who talked about if you want to be convincing, use pathos, ethos, logos, logos. Um, and here we are, we've come a long way over the last 2000 years, but we're still monkeys deep, deep down inside our, in, inside our brains, which is I guess why you call your tool the gorilla experiment builder. That is exactly why we call the tool the Gorilla Experiment Builder. You've got hit the nail on the head. And what's happened recently is that academic behavioral scientists have been developing tools to measure human behavior so that we can study scientifically. So in the same way you might study medicine or you might study engineering, you can study scientifically how people behave on their own and in groups with precision measurements so that you can then make predictions about how humans might behave in a different environment. And that gets really exciting. It is, particularly when we start to talk about big issues, which I think you're going to talk about today. Uh, that's as well that's as the right. Picture. Yeah. So, um, so I guess I was going to get on to like, why is this, or why is the measuring, understanding and predicting of human behavior useful to marketing and sales professionals? Well, the many marketing tactics that you currently use and that many of your clients will use were originally developed by academic behavioral researchers, typically those studying persuasion. So what I'm planning to do today is to give you guys a glimpse into what behavioral researchers are doing now, because the tactics you're using now in business are things that we discovered 40 years ago. So if I share with you what we're doing now, you might be able to jump into the future and you imagine like, well, we're going to talk about social proof in a minute. But the things you get out of social proof, like that, that was huge, right, for, for marketing people. Um, but what we're doing now is, is even more impressive. So to start with, shall I tell you a little bit about three findings from academic research that are now staples of marketing and sales professionals, just to make sure we're all on the same page? Absolutely. I'm already, you've thrown out words that I love. <laughs> Persuasion, <Right>. uh, <laughs> science. We love science. We love it. We love experimenting. We love it. We love testing things. Um, Brilliant. So hopefully you've all heard of finding number one, the paradox of choice. Is this familiar, familiar to you, James? That is absolutely not familiar with me. I'm ashamed to say. Oh well, this is brilliant. That means then, then, um, then maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe I've got more things that I can share with you. So, <laughs> um, this was the initially very surprising finding. To this was from behavioral economists, particularly that consumers don't necessarily want more choice. Even though traditional economists believe that more choice is better and always better, because if you've got more choice, you're more likely to find the perfect fit for you, turns out that we consumers, consumers can be paralyzed by too much choice and we end up making no decision at all. So that's the paradox of choice. And the key finding after lots of experimentation is that customers are more likely to purchase based on six options than 20 options. Six seems to be about the maximum number that we, we can tolerate. And this holds true in business too. So while it's important to have the right package for each type of customer, you don't necessarily need an endless array of choices. 
And certainly what we find in the SaaS business is like three, four, five, often three. James, you, you know, we've talked about um, three. good, best, best, three. Three, <laughs> I love, three. I love the package of three. Yeah, it's so useful. So if the paradox of choice is new to you today, um, one of the things you can do is you can check that your sales material doesn't require your customer to make too many choices. Give them a limited range to choose from. Customers are much happier feeling, believing that they've made a good decision. And one of, the, one of the ways they'll decide whether they've made a good decision is to work out whether it was an easy decision. So easy decisions are subconsciously good decisions. Now, if you absolutely must have more options, and I know sometimes people have products that are complicated and you do need to have more options, it's better to sequence decisions rather than putting them all in front at the same time. So you could do out of these three options, pick one of them. And then once they've picked one, you go, okay, now I have one follow-up question. Would you like it with premium support or would you like the cheapskate option, right? <laughs> and that's a way of presenting six options as two choices, one of three choices, one of two choices. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, like people have been part of our world for a while, while now are listening to this going, this science totally underpins everything that we've been learning in the B2B school. Uh, we talk about product ecosystems, which is introducing choices uh, incrementally. We talk about making sure that you don't have, well, you know, we recommend three choices rather than six. It's interesting that you've put a limit on it. When it comes to testimonials, we have ideas about what's going to work. But at the end of the day, a confused mind always says no. Uh, and, uh, and that's what Joe is telling us here, yeah. sharing the science that underpins it. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that's a lovely summary. A confused mind always says no. So insight number two from us behavioral scientists is anchoring and framing facts. I've got two little cartoons for you here because because they make me make me giggle. So the anchoring effect shows that humans are not rational, logical computers that make absolute judgments. Instead, we very sensibly take cognitive shortcuts and make value ju judgments based on comparisons. So in this little cartoon, there's a mug for three hundred dollars or a mug which was a thousand dollars and is now three hundred dollars, and you're definitely going to go for that more expensive mug because you're getting more value for that. It's that's a logical, sensible choice. <laughs> So that's called the anchoring effect. The framing effect is similar, but different. The same information can be presented in different ways. So here we've got a nice little cartoon, 20% fat. No, 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 no. 80% fat free, yum, I'm <laughs> gonna go for that. Um, another nice example is that I might happily sign a medical form with a 90% chance of success, but I may may hesitate if you say it's got a 10% chance of error. So logically, these are exactly the same statement, but the framing of it, the framing of making, making it more positive has a difference on the mind and it's just easier and, and process. So where do we commonly see this in business? As we saw before, consumers like some choice, but you can frame this choice so that one is very obviously wrong and, the other, and between the other two, one is very obviously better. This is a very common technique used by real estate agents um, if you're going on a, on a set of viewings, um, they might take you to three properties, uh, one outside your price range, that's there to, for you to discount easily and you're confident in that decision. And then there'll be two that are within your price range, one with really nice decor and the other one a little bit shabby. So now you've got to make really easy decisions to make that you're going to go for the better one of the two. And I think, as I said earlier, humans will conflate ease of the decision with confidence in the decision. So, so that makes, makes you make the decision faster and pushes you out of your, your tendency to go, oh, I'm not yet sure, I'm not yet willing to take the plunge. In, in, in our world, we'll, we'll, uh, we have a training program called The Pointy End and we've got a lot of students that go through that program. They chunk down what it is that they're doing. They package it up into sets and then they introduce it to clients as one of three sets. One of those clients is up here. It's very expensive. We call that the premium. One of them is down there. We call that the Patsy. And then in the middle, we have the preferred, which is almost identical in price to the, to the Patsy, but with a lot more features. Uh, and uh, it's just amazing to watch uh, our clients step out of the, sometimes presenting to a client for the first time and say that they went for the middle option. And we're like, what a surprise. <laughs> and then occasionally they turn around probably about five to 10% and say, I want the really expensive option because there's also a type of person that always wants the most expensive. Yeah, 
And isn't that great for a business that somebody turns up and says, yes, I, I just, I want the premium product. Just give me the premium product. I, I, and, and you get that often from really big companies where um, I think, it's IBM, isn't it? Nobody was, was ever fired for choosing IBM. They know if they go for the most expensive product, they're not going to be fired for it. Yeah. Right? It's just, it, it's, going to, it's going to deliver what they need. But I love this as well, too, because the anchoring is an example of anchoring just there. The framing effect, look at your competitors, uh, work out why everybody loves your competitor, and then turn that into a negative that you can use. So, for example, if everyone else is going with a consultant and you're a DIY service, you can say, um, consultants are more expensive, we're, we're less. Or you become beholden to a consultant. With us, we're going to give you autonomy and freedom. So it could be, you know, rather than, hey, you have to do all the work, it's you get autonomy and freedom. And you can balance those things off against each other. And that's framing. Love it. Yeah, and you, you know, in that, in that situation, you definitely want, don't want to... Um sort of hand over your power to somebody else, do you? You want to keep those skills in-house. If, if Absolutely, if that's the way that you're doing it. If that's the way that you <laughs> do it, exactly. If, if you're a consultant, you're going you're gonna to frame it another way. We can do it for you. We can do it we for you. Don't have to worry all about that it. All of that pain. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and then the third example that, uh, that has come from behavioral economics is about social influence. Social influence is so important. And whole businesses that didn't exist when I was I was a teenager now exist because social influence is so important. Mm. Now, what the psychology tells us is that we're influenced by reviews and testimonials because we want to be part of the in-group. At a subconscious level, our brains believe we'll be an outcast if we disagree with the, the group. And social exclusion is one of the most painful experiences for a human. Anybody listening today who remembers those days at school where maybe your best friend wasn't there that day and, and you suddenly were like, oh gosh, or you've had to go to a party before your friends arrive and you're like, oh no, I don't wanna be in the room first when I don't have any friends. Like as teenagers, it's, it's intolerable. But even as adults, social, social deprivation is really painful. It's, 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 it's not just unpleasant, it's painful. Mm. Um, now, it's important to remember that both positive and negative social information have more impact than they, they should. So social, the way we think about this in terms of psychology is that social information, social information is amplified, both good and bad. So a positive review, when people read that, they think more of your product than they should. But with a negative review, they think less of your product than they should. So we're, we amplify our processing of social information. Wow. Now, where do we commonly see uh, social influence being used by businesses? Um, we see testimonials and case studies are how businesses apply this finding from social psychology. And we, we talk about social proof. Um, and also with those annoying pop-ups that pop up in the middle of a shop when somebody's buying something and says, so-and-so has just bought this, so-and-so has just bought yeah. this, so-and-so has just bought this. Um, now, there are some people who have the very opposite uh, feeling about social proof. I remember uh, I was working in an art gallery we were selling art and there was this amazing sculpture, like amazing sculpture. It was, it was the, um, the premium product, right? It was about 10 times the price of anything in the gallery. And it was one of six. And I was chatting to the guy, I was like, oh, so like he'd been circulating, circul circling it for a while. And he's like, it's really lovely. It's really nice, but I don't buy one of sixes. I want one of one, but can I buy all six and then destroy the other five? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Like I'm going to have to go back and talk to that talk to the, the artist. artist. <laughs> anyway, so so social proof. Um, what could you do in your business about this today? So, what I said at the beginning is really important. We're influenced by reviews and testimonials because we want to be part of the in group, and we want to be a part of an in group that we really identify with. So, a review or a testimonial is fine. They're nice. They're positive. But if that person reminds me of me, it's going to have far more impact. So if you have testimonials and case studies for each of your, your, like if you sell different types of business or you sell different types of products, you want to develop specific testimonials and case studies for each specific type of client that you serve, right? So for real estate, if you were selling to a real estate business, you'd want specific case studies for them. You'd want specific ones for managers, for managers, whereas the guys on the street are different ones. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, we, we, um, we teach, uh, and it's a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people say the opposite of this, but we teach have one testimonial, have five, mm -hmm. or five or more, one or five or more. And the reason is if you have one, it has to be specifically tailored to the person and they read it and they go, wow. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there is that moment where someone can read it and go, that person is not identical to me. Therefore, what you're saying is not applicable to me. And it has the reverse mm -hmm. effect. If you've got five or more, they don't, they don't read them. They just have a look at all these testimonials. And there is this, and I guess this is a form of social proof. They look at all these other ones and go, a lot of other people think that they're that they're pretty good. So I'm not even going to read them. I'm just going to scan them and it's going to have a similar impact on me. But mm -hmm. three is a bad one. Three is a bad number because they'll read and two is a bad number and four is a bad number because they'll read all three or they'll and they might read all four. And of those four, if one of them is not quite right, as you said, it's amplified. And they go, yeah. oh, well, none of them are right because that one wasn't right. Yeah. And the other one is but pretty right, but that one's not right. So they're not all right. Yeah, well, this this probably feeds into another finding from from um, psychologists around uh, memory, and this is this is a trick that magicians exploit as well. So, if a magician is running a trick on you, they'll do the same trick, and they'll, to you, you'll think it's the same trick, but they'll use the mechanism. They'll do the mechanism differently two different times. Actually, how they make the trick work, um, and that. But then when you go away and you think about it again, you'll go, oh, no, 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 and somebody goes, well, maybe they did this. And you're like, no, 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 he can't have done that because he did this other thing, and you your memory for it goes wrong you start conflating which bit of the magic trick happened with which time they went through so you can't piece it back together to think about it clearly so when you've got five testimonials you're doing the same thing you're giving somebody too much that they can remember so they read the different testimonials and then out of those pieces they're cobbling together the perfect testimonial for them <laughs> there you go once again, that's how it works. We do things, we don't always know how it works, but that's, but that's how it works. That's, that's how it works. works. Great. So <clears throat> back to behavioral market research. So that was a little history trip into academic uh, behavioral economics and, and, and how that's already influenced the, um, the art of marketing and sales. But now we should go back to what I'm meant to be talking to about today, which is behavioral market results, uh, behavioral market research. So what's the big problem academics are trying to solve. So I love this quote by David Ogilvy. People don't think how they feel, they don't say what they think, and they don't do what they say. Yeah. Takes a little bit of time to unpack that sentence. <laughs> I think it's purposefully designed to be confusing. Mm. But you get the gist, which is what does this tell us about surveys and focus groups, which is how a lot of traditional market research is done. Surveys tell us what people think. And what people think is not how they behave. And focus groups tell us what people say. It might even tell us what one person says and then everybody else in the group goes, yes, yes, I think exactly the same thing. But that doesn't tell us how people behave. So neither of, of neither surveys nor focus groups measure what people will do. And in sales and marketing, we're interested in what people will do. Most human behavior is automatic and unconscious. And importantly, our, we, we, it's an automatic response to our feelings. The, the reality is that life is just too complicated to go around like a computer evaluating every single decision we have to make. So we take huge cognitive shortcuts the whole time and we just go with what we think is the best option based on our feelings the whole time. Um, and, and so that, that's, that, that's why what we think and what we say don't necessarily influence our behavior as much as we think. So traditional market research agencies can tell you what people think and what they say, but very few use any research methods, methods that measure and predict human behavior. And this is not to say that um, what people think and what they say is useless. It, it's part of the picture and people want to be able to talk about their decisions uh, with ease. So you can't... It, it, there's new there's nuance to it so if you ask somebody why did they buy us this expensive sports sports car they're going to talk about the luxury and the feel and the speed and and um but really it's just because because they just feel great right yeah yeah anyway we so the words that they use and we can take those words and we can use those words in the marketing the turn of phrase that the target audience is likely to use but at the end of the day this this quote's amazing yeah 
So, so that leads us to think, think about if surveys and focus groups tell us what, what people think and say, how could we run experiments on people to find out how they're going to behave? Is that possible? What if, for instance, we could test behavioral responses to new product designs before they've been created or to new adverts before you've launched them or to new offers before they go out to a mass audience? What if we could optimize new products and messaging for those products before we even start manufacturing? So by looking at the work at the forefront of behavioral science, we might be able to find answers to these questions. Now, there's another group that run experiments on humans every day, and I expect there are some listening to us now. Digital marketing professionals are extraordinary at running experiments, testing an idea, seeing what works, and repeating this to optimize conversion rates. They measure and optimize for human behavior, not what people think, not what people say, not what people feel, just what people do. They are the ultimate data scientists when it comes to human behavior. And this is why I love digital marketing. The process and the work that they do is beauty itself. Academic persuasion researchers would have kittens at the number of experiments you could run to test their hypotheses. And of course, you can't actually test academic hypotheses on a real world site. No business in their right mind would test ideas with the de degree of confidence that academics need to publish papers. No business would set a control conditions where users aren't nudged at all to see how bad that really is. But what's so amazing about digital marketing is how cheap it is to make changes. After all, we're just changing which pixels light up on a screen. We might not even have to change the product at all. But that's where digital marketing has its limits. Even with sometimes with digital products, wouldn't it be nice to test ideas without making changes to your main site or playing with live ammo? If you make a change on your site and then somebody goes and buys it, you then have to fulfill what they've gone ahead and bought. And what if non-digital products could be tested and optimized in the same way at scale with thousands of participants, thousands of humans in your, you know, in your target market, different ages, different de demographics, and we could do that using techniques that measure human behavior. So that's what some behavioral scientists are working on now. We're working with researchers that want to test participants. Participants is what academic behavioral research is called humans. Yep, it wants to, test, <laughs> want to test humans in, uh, test participants in what looks like a normal online shop, but behind the scenes, it's a powerful research tool. Now, this isn't a tool for testing UX. This is a tool for testing psychological nudges. Researchers can change prices, they can change taxes, they can put in subsidies, they can put in adverts, they can change labeling, they can change the features. And our research, so our researchers are often commissioned by governments to address national health, environmental or inequality challenges. So a lot of their research focuses on food purchasing behavior. The, the premise being is if you can change what food people buy, then you're going to change what food people eat. And if you can change what food people eat, then you're going to help with the obesity crisis, which you know, across the Western world is costing governments a lot of money. Mm. Food packaging has a very big environmental challenges. So governments want to understand how much will a consumer pay to buy biodegradable packaging? And if you've got biodegradable packaging, do they go, oh no, I don't want to have meat in biodegradable packaging. I want it in the plastic because that feels safe and healthy. Or is there a particular wording that would work that will make that transition acceptable to consumers? So with these tools, researchers are testing new products, new labels, new adverts, new nudges, all before the products even exist. They can find out how much consumers will pay for a healthier lifestyle, how much they'll pay to avoid plastic, and which adverts and offers will maximally impact their behavior. And the findings of their research make it into public policy or into government regulation. Now, the tool they use to do this research is the Gorilla Shop Builder. That's my tool. Um, and so the big idea is that to the participant, it looks like a normal online shop to maximize realism. But behind the scenes, there's a whole world of research tools to test a wide range of psychological nudges. Now, this isn't a real shop. People can't actually go and buy what's in there and take it home. But it's more, it's more what we call ecologically valid than just 
putting a survey in front of them and going, hey, which of these two options would you choose? We realized that A-B testing in a real life site is an alternative approach, but when it comes to uh, nudging food choices in the way that governments want to, they can't go to a supermarket and say, hey, we want you to change the, put some taxes on some food in your shop. The, uh, the supermarkets would just turn around and say, uh, no, <laughs> no, I don't think I will. We've, we've run experiments too around pricing and we've done it in the, you know, the great hacker way. And uh, sometimes you might be testing all sorts of different prices because you want to sell the most volume at the, at the highest price. And we've done that um, and has backfired on us in the past where someone has said, I was on your site yesterday and I bought the product at this price. And now I'm here today and the product is this price. And the only backup that we had, and it worked out not so bad in the end was, yeah, we're split testing prices. Would you like it at the lowest rate we're split testing? And then they'd go, oh yeah, whew, yeah, no, yeah. That'd, be, that'd be great. I'd really like that. And, uh, but that first email, the first time we ever did this, and someone freaked out was awkward. Now, yeah. at that time, I think I had probably three staff. So it was a very scrappy little business so I could get away with it. But the bigger that you get and the more staff that you have, the more customers that you have, you don't want to alienate the existing customers. You might have shareholders, you might have all sorts of different people. And you get to a point where, um, yeah, where, uh, where the, the, the sneaky growth hacking tactics just get dangerous and you're dealing also with like uh universities and um all sorts of big institutions yeah. as well aren't yeah you? we have we have to be really with without clients we we can't we can't, we wouldn't be able to change our prices that regularly the way that grant cycles work and university budgets and pricing work it's like we're lucky if we can change our prices once a year and it's very much like we have updated our pricing we have put it up by this percentage in order to reflect this additional value in the product um, we are now going into buying season. So we're letting you know that if you make the purchase in the next 30 days, you can have the existing rate. So <coughs> it, it's in my business, it's very much a question of being very transparent and very clear and very fair, right? We wouldn't be able to show different, different prices on different pages. No. But with an experimental shop, if you're developing a new product, which doesn't exist in the market and you're testing humans who aren't actually buying your goods. You're just trying to see how, how different groups of humans behave in different conditions. So typically with an experiment, you'd have a control condition and then some other conditions as well. And then you'd see which of these conditions perform better than the control group and in what way. So you might test different things in different conditions. And so the beauty of an experimental shop is that you're not playing with reality. You're not upsetting any actual clients of yours. So I was going to talk through some examples of the types of things um, we've seen run in the shop, because I always find it much easier to understand what's possible with concrete examples. Absolutely. So here are some illustrations. By changing labels on products, you could test and optimize product positioning. So like how, how you're positioning it. So is, is, is a muffin a really cheap cake or is it a really expensive biscuit? I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. Um, but you can test that, what frame of reference you, you set up. You can test and optimize special offers. You can test and optimize delivery options um, or, or any other features of your product. So you could, you could in your shop just have different things turned on, turned on and off based on where you needed the information. With an experimental shop, you can investigate the effect of labels on purchasing to establish what your customers care about and what they're willing to pay for. I, I have a very young daughter, she's, she's two. Um, and there are lots of, uh, lots of um, clothing stores for young kids that, that tell you that the clothes are made of organic cotton. Uh, organic cotton, not just cotton, but organic cotton, because that's good and soft on their skin, um, which is great. But they sell it to me because it's good and soft on their skin. And all I'm thinking in my head is like, yeah, yeah it's biodegradable, that's excellent. Like if this ends up on landfill, after a few years, it's going to be torn to shreds because there's no plastic in it. So that's what would work on me. And it's fine, I can make the translation in my head. But what a lot of mums want to buy is organic cotton, like really, really soft, baby soft, no chemicals next to their baby skin. Um, importantly, with an experimental shop, you can test these ideas before developing your product. That's the really exciting thing. So behavioral market research can be used to optimize the design of a product and help you identify a niche that values what you have to offer. 
Another area of research is seeking to understand how to nudge someone away from their status quo. The big idea is that when a client adds the package to their basket, you offer them an alternative at that point, your alternative. So if you think about your favorite brand or product, what would it take to switch you to another brand? Would it be highlighting a specific feature, uh, the new products being a specific price point or the packaging, or, or do you need to have this and that? Or maybe the specific way of wording the swap. I remember talking to a marketing guy once about the difficulty selling um, sanitary products to teenagers because women are really sticky on their sanitary products. Um, and teenagers tend to be bought their first sanitary products by their mothers. So in fact, the decision on what brand of, of tampons or sanitary towels you buy has been made by my great grandmother. And I have no choice in this whatsoever. So this is a really, really difficult market. So working out how to switch people from one brand to another is a really big question. Can you do it? Of course you can do it. <laughs> you can do it, but you need to know exactly how you're going to do it. And what you need to know in order to do it is not is how your brand competes against the other brands and it doesn't compete in the same way against different brands, right? Yeah. So you need to know which values your brand owns versus the values of each of the competitors and you find the one where there's the biggest difference and you pull that one out. Mm. Now there is a company called Nielsen that will do that analysis for, for you if you're if you're selling branded goods. So they they run what's called a um, test of implicit attitudes on um, brands and their values. And they've got, got this going back something like 20 years across 50,000 brands. And they'll tell you which brands own which, which values. And then they can pull out any two brands and tell you how they differ on their values. So where there's the biggest difference um, yeah. that you can compete on. Isn't that extraordinary? It is. Yeah. I'm already thinking about ideas. I'm going to let you continue because you've got more to cover, but I've got uh, ideas that, I'm, that I might share at the end if we've got time. Oh, that would be great. My That's brain is great. spinning in a good way. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, so using swaps, you can run a series of experiments to see how you need to frame a swap to get the most people changing to your brand. And when you've tested this in a few different ways, you've got the data to show which, uh, which nub lead, leads to the most swaps. And you can then have the confidence to launch that new messaging on your live site. And as a final idea, is another way to use an experimental shop is to quantify the impact of advertising or content marketing. How well do your adverts work? Do they actually influence buying behavior? Do you have a few different types of adverts, but you aren't sure which one leads to the most conversions? Now, that's fine. You can do, if you've got a digital product, you can do your conversion rate optimization. But what if you haven't yet made the product and you don't have anything to sell? that's where an experimental shop would, could come in. You could, uh, you'd run a whole protocol which first shows someone an advert and you'd have a control condition where there isn't an advert for your product. And then you'd have other conditions where there are adverts for your product. You would then take them onto a dummy task, you know, maybe paying Tetris for five minutes just so they forget that they've seen an advert. Then you might have another chunk of adverts not including your product. And then you jump them into the experimental shop and go and see what they buy. So this could, and if they do buy more of your products and you know that ad, that advert, which was played 15 minutes before has nudged their behavior. And what's important is you can run this type of experiment before developing the actual product. It might seem strange to go, oh, do I really need to write the advert for my product before I even develop it? Yes, yes, you should. I think it was Jeff Bezos who famously said that product managers should write their press releases first. This approach, and we're saying take this approach even further, test your press releases before you, you start developing your product. And by testing your press releases, you can then use that to optimize your product design so that you've designed the best product, possible product for your market. So to wrap up, I want to recap on what we've chatted about today, James. We chatted about three marketing concepts that came from behavioral research. We talked about the paradox of choice, we talked about anchoring and framing effects, and we talked about social influence and how you can use these in your business if you aren't already. And we then spoke about why behavioral market research is important and how it is different from survey, for surveys or focus groups. I think Maya Angelou famously said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. Don't you just love that? 
Yeah. And they show you who they are with their behavior, not with their words. Then we spoke about digital marketing because digital marketers are behavioral scientists and data scientists and running really cool digital experiments every day. They're running these amazing real-time experiments. It's really quite wonderful. But running experiments in reality can feel scary. Playing with live ammo is risky. So we introduced a new research tool at the cutting edge of behavioral science, an experimental shop. And then we talked through three shopping experiments just to give you an, uh, some flavors of ideas of what might be possible. And we looked at changing messaging and labeling. We looked at offering swaps to find out how to nudge people off their status quo. And finally, we looked at not only writing our press release, but te market testing it and using that to inform product design. Obviously, there's so much more that is possible once you embrace behavioral market research, such, but we don't really have time today. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you very much, James, for having me here today. It's been absolutely delightful. Um, if there are any consumer insights, uh, consumer insights scientists or product managers that are moved by the idea of evidence-informed decision-making, we're always delighted to chat about what is possible in terms of behavioral market research. Today, I've only shared a fraction of what is being worked on. Uh, my contact details are on the slide, so do reach out if you'd like to chat further. And I'm going to add Joe to our Facebook group so that we can ask Joe more questions. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret, Joe. Don't tell any of the other speakers this, but so far, I suspect that this has been my favourite. Don't tell <laughs> anyone, though, okay? Because this is this is the type of stuff that I love. It really is. Um well, I'm good. I'm glad I did a good job. I always like knowing that I've done a good job again. <laughs> You've made my day. Yeah. <laughs> and there's so many bits that I want to go back to and revisit. And that's because often um, we try things and we experiment, but we don't often know how and why, why they work. I'm actually going to quickly go back to those three experiments that you ran through. The first, what was the first experiment? What, would, what did you call that one? It was where you were comparing, say, for example, price versus an environmental impact. What did you call that experiment? The I you just testing labeling. So you can just try different testing labeling. labeling. In the, oh, yeah. So I, it's all about the product labeling, the product positioning. Um, you know, when you go to go to a shop, it, you might have a thing like this is fair trade or this is biodegradable, but all of these are just labeled, right? Yeah. And you can put any number of different ones onto your product and you can change them. So what I'm going to do is... I'm going to frame this for our people. Uh, there are a bunch of different things that we can tackle in our own businesses when it comes to differentiating ourselves. And they come down to um, competitive advantages, unique sales propositions and features. And that conveniently spells cuffs. Competitive advantages, unique sales propositions and features. Um, CUFs. Um, in that instance, that is a great opportunity to test features. So, uh, you know, whether it's in, in, the, in the case of a consumer product, whether it's biodegradable versus whether it's super soft. Um, if you're running a B2B business, your features are going to be slightly different. So it, could, it can be something like we're more hands-on versus uh, our competitors that are uh, less hands-on. It can be all those different factors. The, the next one I thought fascinating, and that was when you talked about swaps, and that is really amazing stuff. If you can get someone to move from somebody else to you, uh, that is some next level stuff. And I and it was interesting, you know, hearing Joe talk about products that our parents introduced us to to our grandparents. And I do know it in the B two C space, there are things like supermarket brands and banks. And these people spend a lot of time and money and research trying to figure out how to get someone to move from somebody else to them. And they've noticed that there are there is a factor that wasn't discussed today, and that is life change. So we get married or we go through a divorce or we have some kids. There are these moments where we do go through that and, and everything's up for grabs. But, there are, but it's hard to catch someone during those one or two or three times during their lives. In the B2B space, once again, when we look at swaps, um, this is where we talk about uh, where we might look at competitive advantages and competitive advantages um, come in all different shapes and sizes. But Joe said it perfectly when she said, it's about looking at your competitors. It's a look about looking at what really stands out for them. You know, what, what, why people are buying from them. And a little bit earlier, we talked about trying to identify those competitors and flip them on their heads. So, you know, they say this is the, the best thing since sliced bread. It's your job to turn around and go, well, you know why that's a problem? 
uh, and then and then frame yourself to use more of Joe's language to frame yourself as the better alternative comparison. So that there is features competitive advantages. And on the third one, when we talked about advertising, that can often be something like uh, your unique sales proposition. It's it's that little thing that deep down inside here that makes us choose someone ahead of somebody else. USPs can be very tactical. They can be very pragmatic and functional using the logical parts of our brains. But the best USPs, sometimes people don't even know why they go for one brand over another. It's that, what was that great site? What was that great Ogilvy quote that you had? The David Ogilvy quote? I don't yeah, know people don't. Oh, I, never <laughs> I knew it the moment I said it, I went, here we go. Uh, I, I can put yeah, it People up. don't know what they think. They don't know what yeah, they, they, they say. But we know, you know, we don't do what we say, but go. we are driven. People don't. There we go. Here. You can say people it. People don't think how they feel. They don't say what they think and they don't do what they say. Yeah. And then when you were talking about that, you said at the end of the day, they usually just, they make decisions almost entirely on feeling and everything else is a justification of that feeling. Um, when it comes to that idea of advertising at the very end, um, I, I'm just going to actually introduce another practical example. And that there is um, retargeting ads. So a lot of the ads that are out there and you're talking, I mean, like I used to run a print magazine. We used to run ads in magazines for our clients. And they used to say things like, I know that half of my advertising works. I just don't know which half. <laughs> and then they'd go hit the squash court and I don't know, whatever. You know, that was the old days of advertising. Now we generally know what's going to work and what's not going to work. But there are still scenarios where it would be better to test these things out before spending a whole lot of money which is what Joe's talking about. We don't want to launch like a blockbuster movie and then cross our fingers on, uh, on opening night and it's either going to be a hit or a flop. We don't want to find ourselves in that position. But even if you have launched and you are running a business, I can see how these principles can be applied to a concept like retargeting. And I bring that up because we have ads specifically designed to get people to a blog post or to capture the lead. And then we run these retargeting ads, which are usually about feeling and emotion and we don't necessarily know what works. So I can see how something like this would apply in that scenario as well too. Now I've just totally taken this off in, with a whole bunch of wild ideas. I loved it. I loved your ideas. And I love that the three examples I came up with completely independently nestled so perfectly with your framework. The same work. It's as if it's been <laughs> We know what we're talking about. Yep. Features, uh, competitive advantages and, and USPs, USP. uh, uh, which you know, if you uh, if you spell them in the right order, spells C U Fs, uh, but you don't want to go features USPs competitive advantages because that might spell something different. <laughs> <laughs> on, on on that fun note, I want to thank you, Joe, for your time. As I said, I've really enjoyed this, uh, and I really look forward to continuing this conversation in the Facebook group and uh, and in other places in the future. So thank you so much, Joe. And thank you for you, James. This has been delightful. It's always a huge pleasure for me to be able to share behavioral science insights with a, an audience that's going to enjoy them. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. It's been absolutely delightful. We're gonna, we're gonna, we not only enjoy them, we're gonna use them and take action. Thanks, Joe.